SCP-5657. Nikki knows. In the SCP universe, there are plenty of anomalous humans roaming around the planet unbeknownst to the world at large, along with plenty of entities that are pretending to be normal humans. As far as the Foundation is concerned, this is bad news, and needs to be corrected. Depending on the article, the Foundation can handle these things gracefully or with an unnecessary amount of cruelty, but either way they're going to handle it. SCP-5657 is about both an anomalous human as well as some anomalous entities pretending to be humans, and for once, the Foundation might want to be nice to one to help take out the other. The document begins with a user attempting to access a secure section of a Foundation facility, although their username is only listed as user not found. The system states that their final clearance requires completion of the nose test, which involves placing their hand through a slot in a door. On the other side of the door, SCP-5657 is awoken by the system, much to their irritation, and they argue that they didn't hear about any tests tonight. The system, however, insists that they place their hand on the visitor's wrist, and begin blaring an alarm until they do so. After 5657 places their hand on the wrist, the system asks if the person has a heart, to which 5657 hesitantly responds that they do, but then cries out for them to wait. The system then glitches out as it is about to engage a lockdown, but instead grants access to the mysterious user. Since it's the user's first time in the section, they must review a number of different documents relating to 5657, starting with the containment protocols and description. The containment protocols state that all essential operations within the section are to be overseen by an AI, with internal security protocols only able to be revised by O5 executive order, and only after a full council screening via the NOSE test. If an individual undergoes the NOSE test and SCP-5657 does not give the code phrase, I can feel their heart beating, automated restraints will keep the individual fully immobilized. Should this fail, or the individual poses any threat to 5657, they will be terminated via automatic gunfire. Secondary to 5657's survival, however, is the live capture of a Group of Interest 115 specimen, which is considered paramount in averting a total SK-class dominance shift scenario. Upon exiting this section of the facility, the user will be amnesticized to remove all knowledge of 5657 and its existence. Sounds like there's a lot of serious stuff going on here, and it doesn't sound good for the Foundation that this mysterious user has gained access. SCP-5657 is a human named Nikita Ludo, a television personality from Jacksonville, Florida. From 1995 to 1997, Nikita hosted a daytime talk show titled Nikki Knows, a show formatted to resemble a therapy session. The hour-long show would feature weekly celebrity guests, each recounting childhood experiences and future aspirations in front of a live studio audience. Unlike typical therapy sessions, however, Nikki would often criticize and berate her guests to the delight of her audience, revealing any lies or hidden details told throughout the interview with seemingly supernatural accuracy. Nikki is capable of C2M minor empathic communication, such as the extrasensory perception of emotions through physical contact. This is overall a rather minor anomaly, and would normally require only passive surveillance on the Foundation's part, but something far stranger is going on here. Nikki became the target of a newly discovered group of life forms capable of mimicking humans, hereafter known as Smiling Men. 
The total population, objectives, and anomalous capabilities of the Smiling Men is currently unknown, but so far they've carried out 26 near successful assassination attempts on Nikki. These attempts continue to occur whenever she is relocated and despite all escalating containment protocols. The most recent attempt was carried out via an undetected form of micro-explosive implanted in the tear duct of a security officer, which left Nikki with third degree burns across 32% of her body and partial loss of lower body mobility. Suffice it to say, these life forms are advanced and quite capable, and regardless of what they want with Nikki, the Foundation is planning to protect her for as long as possible. Part of this reason is because Nikki is the only way the Foundation has of detecting these smiling men, who are apparently capable of perfectly mimicking another human. The description is cut off by the mysterious user, who tells the system to tell them what it's like for her when she touches someone. The system begins glitching out again, as it normally requires a user to completely review the containment protocols and description before moving on. Despite this, the user insists, and the system moves on, to an interview between Nikki and a research director. The interview log begins partway through and it's immediately clear that Nikki is a very talkative individual, hardly letting the researcher get a word in. She says that her show wasn't always like that, as during the first season it was called The Healing Hour with Dr. Ludo. She only really cared about helping people, as that's why she became a therapist, but the producers changed things. She admits that she liked the attention, and meeting celebrities was a bit of a thrill, and she obviously has a mild case of histrionic personality disorder, but what do you expect from the weird witch girl out of Trailer Park Nowhere Jacksonville finally getting some positive reinforcement for once in her life? The researcher stops her and asks her to just answer his original question, on whether or not the producers were aware of her empathic abilities. She says they didn't, they just knew her from reputation, to which the researcher asks if that was her reputation as a kind of human therapy dog. She's shocked at the term, and the researcher clarifies that that's what she technically did for money before and after dropping out of college. She assisted people in finding pleasurable feelings, which she did through physical contact. Just as he's about to suggest a more apt comparison, she interrupts him, and says that she was an emotional guide, and she didn't drop out of college, she just took a few years off to work, and she was planning on going back to finish her degree, but school is expensive and over time her side gig had attracted some wealthy patrons. She was then introduced to a couple of TV executives, who pitched her their Inside the Mind show. He corrects her to mean the healing hour, but then says that what she said was the truth, as they've already spoken to the entire cast and crew. They know that the original show was a generic television psychic program, but then she manipulated the executives to make them change the show to what she wanted. She argues against this, but the researcher quotes from an interview with one of the executives, who stated that he was just humoring her at first with her whole healing hour thing. But then she reached out and held his hand, and suddenly they were talking about his father and all the ways he keeps trying to live up to his impossible expectations. It took a few hours, but she convinced him. The researcher says that she used her abilities to rifle through his emotions, made him vulnerable, then coerced him into producing her show. She says that's not right, and that's not even how it works, prompting him to ask how does it work. She explains that it's difficult, and to imagine touching someone and suddenly a symphony starts playing, or death metal, or freeform jazz. Imagine you look at them, and there's a whole extra dimension of color and size, folding in and spilling off their skin like a melting technicolored silhouette, and it's doing interpretive dance to that music. Imagine trying to figure out what all that is supposed to mean, 
all while your own skin feels like it's on fire, or rotting, or suddenly jolting with overwhelming pleasure. Emotions don't just parade themselves around and tell you exactly what they are, like Snow White's dwarves. Everyone has a totally different frequency, as some people have shame tangled up in pleasure, some people mix joy with fear, some people have anxious, overwhelmed, and spiraling out of control as their normal. The researcher asks to clarify, mechanically speaking, that she still just reads people's emotions and uses that information to influence them. She pauses and says that he's making it sound like some parlor trick, but she spent her whole life learning to live with and control her abilities. It took her years to accept that they were even real, as no one else believed her. The interview is also cut off by the mysterious user, who now tells the system to tell them about the governor and what she felt from him. We cut to another interview with Nikki, where she's saying that although she loved the healing hour, most people didn't, and ratings were low, with reviews calling it softball feel-good garbage. There was talk among the producers of cancelling it, but this changed after episode 18, when she had an outburst with actress Shannon Doherty. She says that she's never felt such loathing before from a person, with Doherty loathing everyone in the studio, as if they were all beneath her. She calls her a reverse pincushion, explaining that when a person is more empathetic, their color or aura looks a bit like a pincushion, with little tendrils of light reaching out to everyone in the room. She says that it wouldn't have been so bad if Doherty was honest about it, but instead she wore a big fake smile and said she was happy to be on the show. Since Nikki knew how false that was, she called her out on it, loudly. During the outburst, her producers looked extremely ready to fire her, but afterwards they gave her an entire new show, as the ratings exploded and everyone was discussing it. The researcher says that he thought it was all about helping people though, but Nikki Knows was more popular. All she had to do was help the celebrity guests find some confidence, ease their anxieties, make them feel safe and suddenly they're sharing all of their deepest, darkest secrets for everyone to laugh at. Nikki says that she knows what he's doing, trying to provoke her so she'll argue. People don't like spilling their guts, but they love correcting people they're angry at. She knows how this works because she's been doing this for a long time, but she says that he's supposed to apologize afterwards, reconcile in order to build a rapport. Then all of those heightened emotions will become associated with intimacy instead of animosity, and your interviewee opens right up. She says that this isn't a talk show interview or a therapy session though, he's just collecting data from an asset. The researcher says that they need that data to protect her and the rest of the world, which she understands. She'd rather be on this side of the blast doors than out there with them, so she tells him to quit pulling her strings and just talk to her. The new show progressed with them bringing on a celebrity guest, her holding their hand and listening to them lie for 10 minutes before spending another 10 minutes tearing them completely apart. The audience loved it, and their security guys worked harder than Jerry Springer's to keep things under control not to mention the censors. They made it 28 glorious episodes until IT walked on stage, the governor. The mysterious user stops the interview and tells the system to show the footage taken from the show during that moment. The sound of applause is heard as the view fades in from black a camera panning above a live audience as the Nikki Nose logo fades in. The camera view changes to show a central elevated podium surrounded by the audience, with Nikki sitting in a red leather armchair across from an empty therapy couch. She makes a few pen scribbles on a pad and then looks up at the camera. She welcomes the viewers back and says that 
They were just talking to film star Mel Gibson about his childhood and feelings towards Jesus. It turns out that he has some very intense feelings about the body of Christ. The audience laughs, and Nikki introduces her second guest, a man called the favorite son of Maryland, and possibly a presidential candidate, Governor Timothy Marshall. The audience applauds as Marshall walks down the aisle, waving and shaking hands along the way. He steps onto the stage, smiles, and grasps Nikki's hand. Over the course of two seconds, her face turns from a cheerful smile to abject horror before she shrieks and jumps back. The two stare at each other, Marshall perplexed, and Nikki terrified as the audience watches in silence. Nikki then runs off stage, and the footage ends. Back to the interview, Nikki says that she's held hands with psychopaths and sociopaths. She's met people who are so repressed that it's like seeing a flickering light at the bottom of a deep well. But with the governor, there was no well, no light, no shape, or smell, or feeling of anything. He was utterly empty. The researcher says that he can see how that'd be unsettling, but her reaction seemed rather extreme. She says that she's not explaining it properly. It wasn't just an absence of feeling, but it was like an empty space where a person should be. It was like a governor-shaped cutout in the skin of the world, a living, breathing, totally unfeeling nothing. The mysterious user comments that this is fascinating, and there might be something to this after all. They know there's more footage from the show, though, and they want to see it. The system tries to reject them by saying that they don't have authority, but they insist, and the system relents. From a security camera on the set, the production assistants begin ushering audience members off the set after 10 minutes. Audience members murmur in confusion, and 16 of them do not leave the set despite PA insistence. The associate producer then appears, telling all staff members to leave immediately. All of the staff exit, and the associate producer locks the doors leading to the set. Meanwhile, all of the remaining audience members, along with Governor Marshall, remain perfectly still. They then all begin moving in unison, congregating, and covering Marshall in a tight huddle. They remain immobile for 23 seconds before dispersing, with Governor Marshall no longer visible. The mysterious user demands that the system delete that footage, and then asks if Nikki told anyone else what she saw or what she felt. Back in the interview, the doctor asks about after she ran off stage, but she says that she didn't just run off stage, she ran clear out of the country. She'll never be able to properly explain how wrong it had felt, and she didn't even tell anyone where she was going because she was that scared. She barely stopped to grab her bag and coat before hopping in her car and driving straight to Mexico. She doesn't know why she picked Mexico other than that she was acting irrationally and just felt like she had to run. Along the way though, she says that everywhere she went, black cars kept following her through every turn. One night they even tried to box her in and run her off the road. She kept speeding up, taking sudden exits, heading further east until she wanted to go south. She didn't stop for 72 straight hours, not until she hit the border. Once she was finally across, she pulled into a motel, and they know what happened next. Mysterious user, however, says that they don't know what happened next, and tells the system to show them. What happened at the motel in Mexico is that a Foundation MTF approached her room, under the guise of the Mexican Federal Police. After hearing the sound of a muffled scream and shattering glass, however, they drew their weapons and forcefully entered the room. They find a tall white male holding Nikki against a wall by her throat. 
Nikki was thrashing while the male figure was standing perfectly still. As the MTF entered, however, he drops Nikki and turns to face them, with both him and Nikki covered in blood. The man begins speaking, exclaiming that Nikki is crazy and she attacked him after inviting him back to her room. Nikki in turn says that he's lying and that he's not even human, as he's empty. The man says that she's totally whacked out, probably on drugs, and he thinks he needs to get to a hospital. One of the MTF agents says that he does, because of his arm. The man's radial bone of his left arm is fractured open, with pieces of the bone extending out. Despite this, the man shows no signs of discomfort, even as he rotates his arm up well past baseline human flexibility. The sound of tendons and bones snapping is heard as he inspects his arm. Another MTF agent tells him not to move, but the man drops his arm in a careless, ragdoll-like manner, his face showing a placid smile as he begins approaching the MTF. As he lunges forward, they open fire, and despite multiple shots connecting, he continues forward. Three of the agents are knocked to the floor as screaming and loud, wet, cracking sounds are heard. One of the agents rolls over, and their camera feed shows the man pinning another agent to the ground, ferociously smashing their own head into the agents. Both individuals' skulls become terminally fractured within seconds, but the man remains fully mobile despite large sections of brain matter being exposed. The man runs out of the motel room as the remaining members of the MTF regroup and continue firing upon the individual, obliterating 36% of his body. He stumbles and finally collapses, his body convulsing for several seconds before dissolving, leaving only a set of clothing and a puddle of liquid evaporating on the asphalt. The mysterious user remarks that that was such a waste, before telling the system to delete that footage as well. They then ask how Nikki managed to survive for so long against that thing. Back in the interview, she says that she had to fight that thing for 10 minutes, and she survived by making it cry. She had paid for her motel room in cash, and was standing over the bed ready to pass out when her stomach reminded her that she hadn't eaten in 72 hours. She went out to the vending machine and was gone for maybe 20 seconds, but when she came back to the room, he was just standing there, smiling at her. She didn't even have time to scream before his hands were around her throat, crushing her windpipe. Then everything went black, and she says that there's no feeling like dying, terror and calm coexisting. Out of nowhere though, the man let her go. She was on the floor gasping and coughing, and when she looked up at him, she could see him crying, clawing at his neck, trembling like a scared puppy. She didn't know what was happening at first, but soon realized that she was also crying, and without knowing it, she had somehow forced those feelings onto him. The researcher asks if she's capable of transmitting her emotions onto other people, as none of their tests revealed that. She says that sometimes she feels like she can almost share a little piece of what she's feeling with someone she's emotionally intimate with. People are too different though, too full and complex, and so trying to impart her feelings onto someone else would be like trying to add a spark to a bonfire. But that thing had no fire, as it was completely empty, so suddenly it was like she was adding a spark to a dry pine bed, and it went up in flames. Rather than running though, she decided to hit him with a chair, as she was running on pure instinct, and her brain switched from flight to fight. She began screaming and smashing the chair into him, breaking his back, arm, and nose, but he didn't even flinch. He just kept trying to get back up, and the only thing that actually seemed to hurt him was when she grabbed his face and gave him another dose of fear. That worked for a while, but either she was losing focus, or wasn't scared enough, or he was getting used to it. Eventually he got back on his feet, 
and so she gave him the only thing she had left, which was anger. That's when the man started hitting her instead of killing her, hitting her over and over until she had 27 broken bones. Her plan had worked though, as she had stayed alive long enough for the MTF to show up. She then asks the researcher if they're close to figuring out a way for her to live outside of containment, and the researcher says that they're very close to a breakthrough and she'll be out of here in no time. When she asks him to shake on it, however, the interview log ends. The mysterious user says that that's enough, and tells the system to delete all the data related to SCP-5657. Afterwards, it orders the system to open the door, as Nikki begins yelling at them to stay away. The individual says that it's strange, they always thought a smile was just a curve of the lips. They had played all their little social games, said all the right words, and they smiled. But then, they met Nikki. Nikki asks how they are even here, as they're under a mountain. The individual says that it's the same reason as always, the human element. The researcher had known that there was no making another Nikki, not after decades of tests and protecting her at cost. Then they took someone the researcher was close to, and they managed to cut a deal with the researcher. Armistice, in exchange for Nikki. Nikki begins crying, telling the entity to just finish it, but it says that they don't want that anymore, as there's so much more she can offer them. She's going to teach them how to feel. A security camera shows the entity reaching out to seize Nikki, when their hand suddenly passes through the space where her neck should be. The entity stands motionless for several seconds with a puzzled expression, before Nikki suddenly vanishes. The containment door to the cell slams shut, and Nikki reappears on the other side of the cell, sitting in an armchair. She asks if the entity cares to sit, and then explains that she is being projected via holographics, and this is a trap. The entity begins looking around the room, with their expression remaining deadpan, but their body language showing visible signs of panic. The entity says that she had touched his wrist, and she was here. Nikki responds that yes, she was and she had not left this cell for 20 years, until tonight. They moved her out of the cell through a secret door nearly 20 minutes ago, right after she had touched his wrist and given him a big dose of curiosity. They only needed him to be distracted for 15 seconds or so, but the curiosity made him continue to flip through the files. She had played him, the researcher had played him, and even the AI had played him, revealing that the system had been faking all of its glitches. Now, the system will be this entity's warden. The entity begins pacing, frantically, before reaching up for their own throat. Nikki says that there won't be any of that, as the researcher reveals that the panels on the walls contain congelation cannons that can release high-pressure foam spray that will instantly restrain him. The entity lowers his hand, and Nikki says that she suggests he get comfortable, as these guys run a lot of tests. This cell was designed to keep things like him out, but it'll do just as good a job keeping him in. The hologram of Nikki stands, with difficulty, as the damaged portions of her leg are supplemented by a robotic knee brace. She brushes herself off and walks directly up to the entity, looking him in the eye. She tells him to settle in, as he's SCP-5657 now, before smiling and disappearing. On the one hand, Nikki lost 20 years of her life in containment and suffered some grievous injuries in the process, and she'll likely still be in Foundation custody for a while to ensure her protection. On the other hand, she finally got to beat one of her tormentors, locking him away for as long as these entities can live for. 
With the knowledge that the Foundation will gain from testing and interviewing the Entity, there's a good chance that they can end up containing the other Entities. Or at least ensure Nikki can live a somewhat normal life from now on. Most SCPs that feature an anomalous human either show the human to be malicious or utterly dangerous, or the Foundation come off as being unnecessarily cruel. But this one shows Nikki to be a likeable and earnest person, born with a unique gift. And the Foundation genuinely wants to help her. It's rare, but I think we can call this one a win for the good guys. <laughs>